So, so let me uh, introduce today's speaker, Professor Yongju Beck. Uh, the in uh, he is in uh, at Seoul National University. So he got PhD in physics at KAIS and he did a research associate and postdoc at uh, Cambridge in the Michael Tate's group and the Technion, the Safri group. And today he is going to talk about the introduction to the statistical field theories for active matters. Um, if you are ready, uh, please. Uh, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. And yes, also, yes. I, yeah, I also I apologize, apologize for my um, a mistake today. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, so I, I forgot about the correct time and then so I had more time to prepare for my talk. So uh, I, I'm very sorry again. Um, yeah, so uh, according to the original plan, I, I, I wanted to um, give a talk which entirely focuses on the statistical field theories. Um, but, but since I uh, got the time wrong, actually, I uh, couldn't complete my preparation. Uh, so, so actually, I'm uh, going to talk about um, the active matter area in general, in fact, and then not, not especially focusing on statistical field theories. So the title is a bit misleading today, but um, uh, please understand. That, uh, I, I got the wrong time. Um, so yeah. So um, anyway, thank you for inviting me uh, to this um, um, this nice series of uh, summer school lectures. Uh, so today I'm going to give you a sort of um, my own version of overview about uh, this area of active matter and how it connects uh, to uh, maybe the emergence of live question. Uh, so. Yeah, uh, here I'm showing you a sort of um, picture or a diagram about how this um, mix of bacteria xanthus, uh, which is like a slime bacteria, uh, uh, lives on life. So, um, so they they are usually like this uh, this um, individual um, bacter bacterium particles, which uh, which uh, just move around. But then, like when it is like when the food is abundant, then they just search for the nutrients in the environment, and they are all scattered around. But, but when when the food is scarce, then uh, what happens is that like they uh, gradually come together and then form some kind of like uh, uh, clusters, and then they eventually develop uh, like this three D like structures, which is a called footing body, and then uh, it scatters the um, how to say that, like the seeds for the future generations. So uh, what happens is somewhat like, um, oops, okay, sorry. Maybe somewhat like this. So initially, uh, when the bacteria are like all scattered around, then they like, you, you can see them uh, just moving around in this way, but then actually they, actually they gradually coalesce together as they start to form this protein body. And then like why, why they do this basically. Uh, there can be some like chemical mechanism and like many other kinds of things. But what is also primarily true here is that these guys are moving around and then when they collide then they tend to uh, push against each other. And then that actually gives rise to uh, some kind of clustering behavior, uh, which is a bit different from how uh, the usual um, phase operation occurs in equilibrium systems. So, um, so this kind of uh, living systems show interesting, uh, like show interesting pattern formation behavior, uh, which you should explain by developing a sort of different kind of field theory. Okay. So, uh, so let me start with the basic uh, question about um, Question is that's going to be discussed throughout this school. Uh, that's the question of what is light. Um, so, actually, this was a title of a very well known book written by uh, this person, uh, none other than Irving Schrödinger. So, uh, basically, in his famous book, 
uh, he had this um, paragraph about uh, what uh, defines light. Uh, so what is the character feature of light? That was his question. Uh, what is a piece of matter set, when is a piece of matter set to be light? And his definition or rather, or his like the central phrases was that something is called living or alive when it goes on doing something. And when it keeps its structure, it's in its order structure by feeding upon negative entropy uh, from the environment. So, uh, so what do these words really mean? Is that like, if you, if you try to interpret it in more like physicist terminology, then an organism stays far from equilibrium and stays ordered by taking energy from the other substance around it and by dissipating heat. So this is what, uh, how you can interpret like Schrodinger's wording that it is feeds on negative entropy and goes on doing something. So for example, um, well, you can, you can imagine some systems which seem to do uh, something like this. And um, let's think about, so for example, this banal cell pattern, which is one example of non-chemical system which might be fitting to this Schrodinger wording of what life means. So essentially what you see here is a system which is like heated from below and is cooled above. So you see this kind of uh, convection patterns and uh, you start to see these convection patterns when the temporal difference between bottom and top is large enough. And then uh, these this convection patterns begin to be shown like this hexagonal lattice if you see it from above. So this kind of system is, seems to be like non equilibrium system uh, which is far from equilibrium and stays ordered by taking energy from the environment. But you, usually you will not call this kind of system really living. Now, but let, let's think about uh, a different kind of far from equilibrium system, which is just like this um, uh, moving bacteria. So they are called, these are called filamentous E. coli. Uh, uh, they're basically uh, like the, those kind of bacteria that live in your guts, but they are like much, much longer than the usual uh, white blood bacteria. And then what you start to see is that they uh, show these kind of, um, this like line-like patterns because they tend to align their directions uh, parallel, to, parallel to or anti-parallel to each other. So yes, here you have these small particles or bacteria, bacterium particles, um, which are moving in directions uh, determined by their body direction, body orientations. And then each of these particles has some kind of driving mechanism. So on the left side, you have this system which is driven by a global, global gradient of temperature. But on the right hand side, you have this uh, uh, non-chemical system which is driven by individual, uh, at the level of individual particles. So uh, when you think about uh, the phenomena in living, collective phenomena in like living systems, or like life phenomena as a whole, uh, you can often find um, the source of non human driving at the level of each component of the system, each microscopic component of the system. So this is like a very, very important uh, feature which characterizes, uh, I mean, which uh, you can often find in living systems. So you may not, it might be difficult to say this is a defining characteristic, but, but it will be difficult to deny that this is like a very, very important characteristic of living systems. Um, so by the way, yeah, uh, I think there seems to be some question here, but uh, let me first, uh, yeah, check it. Uh, so yes, this is just uh, E. coli itself. Um, so I'm not sure about bacteriophytes and FT, what that means, but uh, this is a filamentous E. coli, I think. Uh, which is just a, a bit longer than the usual one. Yeah, so uh, so let me move on. So how, how do you really describe this bacteria motion? Uh, to keep things simple, uh, of, of course the actual motion is, has much more complex uh, mechanisms, but if you keep things simple and just focus on the main features and what have, what these bacteria, how these bacteria move is essentially like this. They, they move their flagella and then they like travel in a straight line for a while and then they 
then start to tumble around. And then after some tumbling phase, then they start to move in another direction. So this is essentially a series of run and tumble motion. Okay, which is shown here. So how this kind of motion differs from the usual summer Brownian motion. In the summer Brownian motion, the particle is passive. So which means uh, the particle, if, if the particle is mechanical energy, then due to friction from the environment, the mechanical energy can be changed to heat or work. Okay. And then from the surroundings, like the water molecules, then uh, the, water, like the water molecules, we hit the pollen, molecule, pollen particle and then thereby transfer heat or work to the particle and the particle again in chemical energy. So there is basically this back and forth exchange of energy between the particle and the surroundings. And for Brownian particles, the exchange of energy happens in a time reversal symmetric manner. So when you actually try to write down the equation, language by equation for this active particle, for this Brownian particle, uh, what you see is that uh, the particle experiences friction, which is basically this energy getting transferred to heat. And there might be like other conservative forces. And then the particle also is having experienced some more noise from the environment, which is this, essentially represents this red arrow energy transfer. And then um, the symmetry between these two directions of energy flow is actually mathematically represented by this fluctuation dissipation relation. So when you calculate the two point correlation of the summer noise, then you will see that it is connected to this friction kernel uh, multiplied by temperature. So these fluctuation dissipation relations mathematically represents the time reversal symmetry between excitation and dissipation of energy of this particle. So when there's this a non trivial symmetry relationship between friction and summer noise, then this particle you can say to be passive. But well, when you now let's turn our attention to this uh, bacteria, bacterial particle, uh, it is going through run and tumble dynamics. And if you look at the energetics of, the, of this particle, then what you see is that it is moving because it is using the energy stored in its body. So there is some stored energy or in general, there might be some ambient source of energy scattered around, which this particle ingests and then converts into mechanical energy. And then there is this uh, exchange of energy uh, with the surroundings. So when you try to model this particle dynamics, then you will have all these, um, uh, these basic terms which you also had in the Brownian particle but in addition, you will have this uh, proportional force, which represents this energy conversion uh, from the food to the kinetic energy. So there's this non constructive step proportional force representing this, uh, this purple arrow, which breaks the time reversal symmetry at the level of each particle. And so this, uh, how this F behaves, uh, is not described by this fluctuation dissipation relation, unlike uh, the summer uh, the particle going uh, going through summer Brownian motion, and the direction of this of the proton force is going to be rearranged at certain rate, uh, which is determined completely by the internal mechanism of this active particle. Okay. So, uh, well, you can you can imagine many many other examples of active particles like um, like active Brownian particle, uh, which you can construct even artificially by uh, attaching or uh, some sort of uh, by coating this uh, this metric colloid particle with some kind of catalyst on one side and then make uh, chemical reactions happen around this particle. And then depending on where this uh, catalyst coated side is oriented to. Uh, the, the direction of propulsion will change gradually. Uh, so unlike the Swanton particles, this active Brownian particle will change its direction, propulsion direction gradually by through, uh, through uh, rotational diffusion, which is shown here in the uh, highlighted in green. Or maybe you can even think about um, the case where this propulsion component 
it's not really like a dynamic variable, but more like a noise, like an extra source of noise, uh, which is in addition to this summer noise. So this pop, this uh, term highlighted in purple, uh, has properties which is completely different from the summer noise. So for example, if you look at the uh, two-point correlation of this uh, this active noise, then uh, it is no longer governed by the collocation dissipation relation that uh, I showed before, but it is now it has now uh, a different kind of uh, correlation function, which is different from the, the friction kernel. So for example, um, this noise might have time scale, which is much, much longer than the time scale of this summer noise. And that would be usually, that would usually be the case in actual systems. And because this noise based approach and dissipation relation, this particle, you can uh, consider uh, to be active. And it breaks time reverse metric. Okay, so yes, uh, you can, uh, so this is a basic, uh, concept of what uh, active matter consists of. So what is active matter? It, it can exist on various length scales, like from like nanometer length scale where you have this uh, molecular motors working on some microtubule or microfilament and to all the way to this meter scale where you have this uh, like animal moving around. But what is shared between all these levels of systems is each particle converts stored energy into systematic motion. And each particle stays far from equilibrium by breaking time reverse symmetry. And each particle has a direction of motion which is affected by a completely inner mechanisms instead of some globally global driving field. So obviously life has um, aspects which uh, feature these three features of active matter. For example, if you look at the level of cells, then uh, the cells, each of them have some individual polarity and they may they might go through even like this division kind of process, which is fundamentally non equilibrium thing. And then if you look at like the inner, inner, inner structure of this each cell, then you will see this kind of like filaments which are growing all the time and then like which might even grow or shrink, uh, depending on whether it's polymerizing or depolymerizing. And then on this, on, on each of these microchips, you have this uh, molecular motor walking around. So on various uh, length scale, a living system is really a hierarchy of machines made from machines. And in the sense, it is obviously an active matter. Now, um, so why are we really emphasizing this active matter aspect of living systems? So basically a physicist's way of understanding live life uh, in a very principle-based approach would be to uh, think about an active matter system, which is similar to certain aspects of living systems. And then like try to think about how symmetry and like conservation rules and dissipation properties of this active matter uh, determine the like the universality class of this emergent phenomena of, of such systems. And then uh, based on uh, this theoretical understanding, you can try to interpret what is happening in living systems. So essentially active matter is a physicist's uh, like paradigm for understanding uh, how life, how living phenomena emerges from uh, microbic mechanisms. So yeah, so this was a rather uh, lengthy introduction. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about mostly about just these two classes of active matter. The first one is the uh, hydroactive gas, which consists of those um, swimming particles, these, these moving part active particles, which don't really interact with each other but just interact with the surroundings, okay? Like the, like the wall place in the system. Uh, so just as in the statistical physics case, uh, you can start from this ideal case like system and then even you can still see many, many interesting phenomena from it. So uh, what happens in ideal active gas? 
uh, first of all, what is, what is obviously uh, imaginable is the situation where you have this uh, asymmetric object immersed in a fluid of active particles. Now, uh, if, if, if the particles on this, uh, this wedge-like asymmetric object were just like water molecules in equilibrium, then the pressure exerted on this asymmetric, asymmetric body will be equal everywhere. And then this asymmetric object will not move anywhere. Uh, but when, when these particles are spinning, then what happens is that the particles approaching from the left get trapped in this wedge, and the particles approaching from the right just slide past this wedge. And what happens is that the particles which are trapped here uh, push this wedge to the right, and then it starts to move to the right. Similarly, if you have this kind of uh, wretched-like uh, object, then the way the particle moves it collides with this, with this wretched and then is scattered differs depending on whether the particle moves from the left to the right or from the right to the left. So the, those moving from the right to the left are more easily trapped. And then those moving from the left to right more easily slides past. So what happens is that this wretched feels experiences a force from the stream particles which tend to push it to the left. So all of these are possible, all of these, uh, this, this uh, this uh, this uh, motion, emergence of motion, is possible because of the broken time reversal symmetry of the leverage particle, and due, which is combined with the asymmetric geometry of the system. So these lead to force on body and net current of particles, and which you can utilize to get directed motion or useful work. So yeah, indeed, uh, you can really perform experiments. Uh, and confirm these phenomena to be really happening. Like right? you have this wedge here, there are like uh, B subtilis bacteria moving around uh, in the system, and then they push this wedge around in the direction of the to the uh, to the to the uh, concave side of the object. And then if you have this kind of uh, wedge like gear here, then as, as you can see, the bacteria around this uh, gear is moving this. Uh, Thing in the clockwise direction. And actually, what is also possible is that, um, sorry, I think, yeah. Even if the object is originally symmetric, uh, actually, the fluctuations from the uh, moving particles can induce asymmetry in the shape of this object and then. And then and they amplify it to some extent. So depending on the like the length scale of this polymer chain immersed in this active fluid, uh, it might start to move in one direction. Or if it is too long, then it will form this S-like pattern and then just just, just uh, move, rotate uh, at some given location in space. So uh, so there can be some kind of symmetry breaking uh, current or volatility. In, in active matter, and, and this effect is present even at the level of ideal active gas. Uh, well, this is some kind of uh, work which uh, my group is uh, doing at the moment, and uh, you can actually show that, even show this symmetry breaking mortality, even in the case of non deformable, undeformable object. So, for example, here uh, you have this. Um, rigid particle, sorry, not rigid, but uh, soft but not deformable uh, object, which is in one dimensional system and modeled by this triangular potential. And if you put many, many uh, active particles around this object, then, and, and if this object is slightly penetrable by these active particles, then what happens is that later they organize themselves by symmetric breaking into this kind of asymmetric profile. So depending on, how strong the repulsion from the wall is. In some intermediate range of wall repulsion, then you can see the steady state velocity of this uh, object being like non zero. So there can be some kind of symmetry breaking mortality arising from uh, these active particles. So essentially, this is like the slight motion of this object pro providing the needed uh, asymmetry of the environment, and then which is combined with the time reversal the lack of time reversal symmetry of these active particles, and then that amplifies 
is uh, is current through the system, don't you count through the system. So yeah, this is an interesting feature of active matter. Like special asymmetry can be spontaneously induced and even be amplified. So we, we all these things show that active fluid can attain sustained mortality and long range currents due to either given asymmetry of the space or due to induced asymmetry of the space. So, well, another interesting thing that you can also think about is what really happens if you have multiple such immersed objects. So, yes, here, where this is where you can now start to uh, think about things in terms of a sort of field theory. So um, here you have let's let's consider an asymmetric object, an you know, active fluid, and let's say you put it here. And now, in the near field regime, uh, so as I should be for using this wet-like object, um, this object is exerting. Uh, so this this object is receiving a force from this the same particles around it to the right, to the right, because the, the active particles get stuck in this concave side of the object. And by action ratio principle, uh, this uh, object is also applying a force to the left to all the active particles around it. Sorry, but by active particles in contact with it. Okay. So that means that this uh, asymmetric objects, to some extent, uh, effectively behaves like a pump in a passive fluid. Now, if the particles uh, move to the far field uh, locations, and then if they, when they start to uh, lose the information about where they were swimming originally, then there will be diffusion in the far field. So, so this thing. Uh, this active part, this, this object in an active fluid is essentially like a pump in a passive diffusive fluid. So you can you can use this analogy to derive some conditions about how uh, this active ideal gas uh, will be distributed uh, in the steady state if you just keep this body here for some time. So now we are now at the moment we are thinking about this passive diffusive fluid around this pump. And then, since this is like an uh, ideal gas, ideal fluid, uh, which who, whose uh, current arises only from diffusion and some kind of local sources of force. Uh, now, in the steady state, you can say that the current uh, field of this uh, active I, sorry, this past ideal fluid is essentially coming from this diffusion part and uh, this local source of force part. And by the way, if this is a pump, then the local source of force will be somewhat like uh, this dipole source in the electrostatic field. Now, since if this is a two-dimensional system, then you can drive the fluid density by solving this, uh, this Poisson equation, uh, which gives you this like uh, power low decaying density field, which is one over R. Ah, so yeah, there's the question about uh, how is the characteristic length scale defined for uh, far field diffusion? Yeah, so um, yes, so that's a good question. So uh, here, what what you have to think about is how uh, far the uh, active particles swim persistently, keeping the original direction of motion. Okay. So, um, like for example, for this um, running tumble particle that uh, I presented as an example in the in the first page, uh, so there is this uh, direction. Uh, so this this length scale uh, through which the particle travels in a straight line. Okay, so this far field has to be much much longer of the much much longer length scale than this this uh, persistence. Uh, swimming of uh, this persistence length scale determined by the particle velocity and this uh, tumbling rate. Now, also, there's another question about why am I using 
D effective instead of D. So yeah, I think I didn't really explain the meaning of D effective here. Uh, so in uh, so I'm actually keeping this D effective notation here because this D here is not really the same as the temperature uh, or, or, or multiple of temperature. So uh, in the usual passive fluid, you have this diffusion constant being given by uh, the Einstein relation. So like D equal to uh, multiple cavity. But in, in inactive fluid, there are extra contributions from the swimming of the particle. So, so for example, there are contributions from like the particle velocity squared over uh, the tumbling rate. So you have to include this extra contributions from the active particle swimming, and then that gives you D effective. Uh, so here I'm, so here rho is like, but, but, but at this stage, of course, yeah, this rho is, the rho is actually the density of passive fluid, uh, but I'm just uh, I'm using the same notation for D, uh, and not, the, not necessarily the notation of giving temperature. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a mistake here, but yeah, that's the meaning of this. Uh, and then, so given the fluid density, uh, you can also drop the current field, because the current is really just the, a gradient of density here. So what happens is that a single local pump creates dipolar density and current fields in a diffuse, diffusive uh, passive fluid. But of course, the same, the same uh, conclusions will also be valid, even if you think of everything in terms of like this asymmetric object and the active particles. So this, this analogy can be made essentially because on a very, very uh, far field, uh, essentially, this fluid is diffusive, and everything uh, looks diffusive on a on a large length scale. Okay. So now, uh, take advantage of this um, this theoretical, theoretical intuition. Uh, you can you can make some interesting conclusions about what are the interactions between objects immersed in an active fluid. For example. Um, you have this uh, parallel, less, less, less think of this parallel roads, road like object immersed in a bacterial bath. Now, uh, so this D is like a separation. L is the length, length of the roads, and this R1 is the persistence uh, length of the same particles. Now, what happens, as you can see here, is that the attraction, the, the amount of attraction between uh, these two road-like objects changes as you vary their distance, d. In, interestingly, it is initially like when it's very small, it is attractive. And at the, as d gets longer, it decreases and then it starts to increase again and become attractive again. And then when d becomes very, very large and it starts to decrease again. And depending on the persistence length scale, RL, you can see that the whole pattern actually becomes longer and longer as other increases. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so how how can you understand uh, these behaviors? So, like when these two plates are very very close together, when distance D is very very small, compared to the length scale RL, then what happens is that these active particles cannot really go into go between these plates and instead uh, what they really do is like they push this rush together from outside. So this is a sort of what you normally would call depletion attraction. Now, but as you start to separate these rods a bit farther from each other, then these active particles can go into this small gap and then get trapped between these plates. And then they start to uh, push this uh, two rods away from each other. Okay. And then what happens after then is like the repulsion between these two rods. And that is called anti depletion uh, force. But, but, but as these guys become farther away, even farther away from each other, then you start to see this attraction again. Now, now how, to, how to understand this attraction? So, um, so there are people who actually studied the system using simulations 
and they call this effect attraction by active depletion. So when they think about how many active particles are between these rods, when the substance is a bit far away from each other, then, then there's a low region, uh, low density region in between these rods, and then therefore uh, the pressure difference due to the density difference gives rise to the attraction between rods. So that's one valid way of looking at this phenomenon. But uh, what this offers are uh, 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 like concluded from the observation is that the range of interaction, the range of this attractive interaction is essentially set by the persistence length RL. And which would imply that there is some sort of some sort of exponential decay in the strength of attraction um, as this, this rods move far away from each other. And with the so the strength of length scale will become other in the case. But actually what we find here using our method is that the rod is essentially like a quadrupole that you see in electrostatics. Okay, I mean, this is a rectangular shape. And when you think about like charge distribution, which is rectangular, then it will give rise to a quadrupole. So what happens here? So when active particles approach this rod from here, from the left or from the right, then such uh, active particles will, like when they, when they touch this rod and then they will start to move uh, sideways in this way. But on the other hand, those um, moving along this rod, we have much, much less chance of turning their direction away from this rod. Okay, so this red arrows, motion in the red arrow direction is much, much uh, less likely, I mean, relatively less likely than this uh, arrows, the motion in the direction of these blue arrows. So what happens is that uh, essentially, uh, there will be some kind of current, uh, which when you have two rods, there will be current which try to push these two rods together, okay? And this, this is essentially like the uh, attraction emerging from quadruple current of active particles. And quadruple currents decay in 2D as one over distance cubed. So therefore, this interaction will also decay as one over distance cubed, which is going to be, which is going to be an attraction. Um, so in, in this way, uh, you can uh, predict how interactions between differently shaped objects will decay over distance. For example, uh, when you have these two uh, asymmetric objects, which are like uh, separated from each other by distance r, uh, then um, the theory predicts that uh, the interaction arising essentially from the density modulation due to the other the other object with the case one over r because this is uh, like a, a dipole field, dipole density field. And you, you can also measure the effective dipole moment of each object and then try to uh, think about what is going to be the, uh, to predict what is going to be leading or the leading far field behavior of this interaction. And then, so, so this, this, um, this black line is with the theoretical prediction that you can uh, get from the measurement of dipole moment of individual bodies. So this is not really a fitting, but this is with a theoretical prediction. And then the simulation result agrees very nicely uh, with the theoretical prediction. That's what you can see here. And of course, the only one gets better if R is much, much longer than the persistence length LR. And similarly, you can also confirm this one of our IQ behavior between uh, the attraction between the rods. And this actually shows you um, that the uh, interaction, effective interactions between objects immersed in active fluid mediated by these active particles has no, actually has no um, length scale governing its decay. Yeah, because these are really power low decay and power low decay is carefree and therefore there's no really length scale here. But of course, you can think about when this power low regime will be start to be dominant and that might have some length scale, but well, uh, if you have to think about 
how this decays, then there's no length field governing structure. And even you can think about torques uh, arising from this kind of interaction, and that they will also be uh, power law. And what is also interesting here is that these kind of forces are not governed by action reaction principle. For example, uh, the effect created by this aspect body is really a change of density here. And then this object uh, will have a different velocity because of this change of density. And that's what we can regard as interaction due to this other guy. And then the direction of force uh, arising from this interaction will be in the direction of this asymmetry, asymmetry of this body rather than uh, determined by where the other particle is. And therefore, there's um, it, it doesn't have to be that there is a action relation principle governing uh, interactions between these bodies here. And what's also interesting here is that body symmetries determine the exponents of power law decay. So by using uh, these kinds of interactions, uh, you, you can construct many, many different kinds of interesting uh, like dynamical behavior. For example, if you just put in like two uh, asymmetric objects and then let them move around, and then what they later show is this kind of um, snake-like uh, moving behavior, and and they basically form a trapping pair, uh, which once formed uh, don't get separated uh, within the observation time that we could uh, implement using our simulation. Okay. And if you put in many, many of these kind of uh, asymmetric objects and pin them on many sides and just let them rotate around, uh, then what you can see later on is this kind of um, emergence of 2D order, sort of 2D order. Okay. So as you can see, uh, row by row, uh, the, these rotors are like pointing in some directions. So it, uh, strictly speaking, this is not really anti-formatic order, but like is formatic order in one direction and anti-formatic order in the other direction. So uh, like if you remind yourself that um, in 2D in equilibrium, of course, you can't have any order disorder transition by Morin Wagner's theorem. I mean, I mean you don't you can't have room range order by Morin Wagner's theorem. Uh, but but in this case, this long range order seems to be genuine, at, at least uh, using the system science that you think of here. And of course, that, that is not a contradiction because this is a non equivalent system. So, yes, even using other active gases, you can see that even without external fields, active matter can induce mortality and currents. And such currents can mediate long range interactions, which give rise to some self interesting self organized structures, which you can't have at or near equilibrium. So, uh, and using this um, interesting phenomena, maybe you can uh, construct some interesting devices uh, based on which you can do this kind of targeted uh, delivery, for example, by constructing. Uh, like potential landscape wisely, you can make these active particles get trapped in some uh, chosen locations. So basically this can be a sort of delivery system uh, where particles just uh, go to their uh, destinations, uh, which you can uh, uh, follow, I mean, by, by just by themselves without any like intricate guide. And another interesting aspect of this uh, lesson from this active agile guess is that, um, so this activity induced current can give rise to some interesting uh, pattern formation phenomena. So for example, in, in, in biological systems, uh, what you have is that like, when you have a like, growing cell and inside this nucleus of growing cell, you have this, um, Chromatin, which is really a chain of DNA. Um, and then their uh, chromatin basically comes in two, have two different regions, like the heterochromatin, which is genetically inactive, and euchromatin, which is actively expressed uh, by uh, 
by RNA transcription. So in, in, in a growing cell nucleus, uh, what you see is that this heterochromatin tends to stick to the nuclear membrane, while this euchromatin tends to stay away from the membrane. Okay. But as the cell ages and becomes older, um, this, uh, this nucleus uh, structure, nuclear membrane structure, tends to have lots of defects later on. And uh, what happens is that this euchromatin regime now no longer stays away from the membrane. And this heterochromatin regime no longer sticks to the membrane, but, but instead uh, what happens is like this, this, this euchromatin, sorry, this um, heterochromatin regime like forms a sort of core and then this euchromatin regime uh, forms a sort of periphery. And then sort of shape, basically the structure of the chromatin changes. Uh, so one way of understanding this kind of structure change is to model, model this system using the binding energies between the membrane and the different kinds of uh, chromatin segments. So for example, as the cell ages, the, nucleus, the, the binding energy between the nucleus and uh, the of chromatin can change. And then that might induce this, this structure change, of course. So that would be a sort of equilibrium explanation for the structure change. But then there's another way of explaining this kind of um, separation. So for example, uh, like there's another study where uh, you basically think of um, like different segments of heterochromatin having different levels of activity. So, so the, the particles with higher activity uh, have higher fluctuations induced by activity and the particle with smaller activity has like lower fluctuations. Then uh, that naturally, naturally leads to um, these active guys getting to the core, getting close to the core of this membrane nucleus and then those with the low activity sticking to the membrane. Okay. And what also can contribute to this kind of behavior is not only the diffusion, but also the active current induced by this asymmetric uh, shape of these segments. So uh, this kind of activity and activity induced currents uh, might be relevant to this uh, biological pattern formation uh, inside a nucleus. Of course, there is not really any experimental proof of this at the moment, of course, we, we don't have any empirical well-defined measurement of this, but it'd be very interesting to imagine uh, how active components of this system uh, contribute to this kind of phenomenon. Uh, okay, so um, I think I have a question here. So there's a question from Ryo, uh, Mr. Ruhanai. Oh, sorry, Dr. Ruhanai. Uh, there's the, what, what, how does this long range order related to the Toner 2 model? Is the mechanism of the violation of Mormon Wagner theorem the same? Uh, okay. So that's a good question. In the case of uh, Toner 2 model, I think there is this uh, spread of order from um, spreading of order from this uh, this course this spreading of this Goldstone mode essentially in the direction which is perpendicular to the direction where this uh, these groups of particles move. So basically, these these groups of particles receive it away from its uh, original propulsion direction, actually spread around the system, and then make all the other particles get aligned in the direction. So thereby spreading long range order. So there's this some sort of um, effective long range interactions mediated, mediated by particles which are giving rise to this long range order, to long range order even in 2D system. Uh, I, so I think, yes, it is, it is possible to say and it's qualitatively that there's something similar happening here. Like, uh, like you have this, um, passive objects which are aligned together and they thereby produce some room range currents which rotate the other passive bodies in some uh, well-defined manner and thereby induce room range order. So there's this room range order mediated by active particles. So, so in, in that way, you might say there's, there's some sort of similarity here, uh, but, but what's different actually here is that um, uh, the, 
uh, in the case of toner two model, you really have this, this direct interaction, online online interactions between active particles. But in this particular system, the ordering actually happens in a rather somewhat indirect manner, like these active particles interacting with um, passive objects and these passive objects changing the direction, affecting the directions of active particles. Okay, so there's this two step procedure. In terms of hydrodynamics, is there a term analogous to convective term? Um, so in this case, everything is really diffusive in fact. So uh, I doubt whether you can say there's any convection here. Um, so this is purely diffusive and uh, At least at the level of the description that I showed you before, you don't really need the conversion term. I think, but but uh, yeah, that's that's my opinion at the moment. Uh, so there's uh, Professor Chang Bong Hyun's uh, question, uh, comment. So I mentioned power law type of force. Um, Power type of force is separation between the plates immersing active particle, but a similar force depends on some sort for passive depletion force. Uh, similar force depends on the passive depletion force. Ah, okay, that's that's interesting. So, uh, so. Uh, Chang Bong's comment is that uh, even for the equilibrium case, uh, the depletion force don't have don't have this particular scale. Okay. Uh, okay, I'd I'd be interested to actually learn about that particular example later. But okay, thank you for the comment. And uh, yeah, there's another comment. So this is the case of active particle motion where hydrodynamics is not uh, really important. So, uh, yep, uh, maybe maybe you can actually say this is really um, uh, so uh, so what uh, okay what active particle motion uh, so how do you dif how do you differentiate active particle motion from hydrodynamics. Uh, Uh, may I jump in quickly? Uh, hello? Yeah. May I jump in quickly that uh, what I meant about hydrodynamics is based on the Reynolds uh, number. Okay. Ah, uh, Reynolds number. Okay. okay. So that case, this case, this whole situation is all active particles. So mm -hmm. um, I think the convection term, of course, there's uh, there is kind of a very minor convection uh, flow. But this is very long range and also very highly uh, far, what is it, far field approximation. So I would say mm -hmm. that, um, uh, as you said also, the speaker said already that convection term is there, but it's not really uh, doing much uh, important role. That's what I was concerned. Uh, okay. Uh, so actually, I have to uh, make one comment here. So, um, mm -hmm. so uh, actually, there are two kinds of active matter system. One is called dry active matter. The other one is called uh, wet active matter. So all these considerations about like low rate number and like the way momentum propagates in the system, whether whether like very rapidly or somewhat slowly, uh, these kinds of issues arise when you think about wet, wet active matter where momentum conservation is important. But uh, in, in this particular situation that I'm discussing, uh, actually the system doesn't conserve momentum. So actually this system, uh, this description works in the regime where the fluid loses momentum very quickly due to the friction with the flow of the system. Or um, this is for the case where uh, uh, you don't have any ambient fluid to begin with, like for example, for the shaker and granular medium. Okay. So yeah, so, so the convection term is actually not important here. 
in this sense. Yes, I agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so I think actually, uh, yeah, maybe there are more comments here, but I have to continue. Now, uh, so I think I probably have 13 minutes now, but uh, let me turn to this case of scalar active matter. Uh, now, now you start to have this uh, repersion, some bit of repersion between particles. So what happens when you think about uh, some degree of repersion between particles? Uh, what happens is that so this, is, this is like the simulation or simulation of active Brownian particles, which you can experimentally construct by using this genus particle, which, which is caught to the one side, on, on, only on one side, with catalyst, for example. And, but this is just a simulation. And in this case, uh, you start to see uh, this kind of clustering behavior. So what is interesting here is that um, as increased particle space, speed or particle density, uh, you start to see uh, this space separation behavior into dense and sparse regions. Now, uh, in this case, you don't actually need any attractive interactions between particles. All you need is just the uh, proportion and this persistence time scale, which tends to make the particle propel in the same direction for some time. And then it's very short range uh, repersion, historic repersion between particles. And given these elements, we, uh, then even without attraction, then this particle will form these clusters and they separate. And, and sometimes when you when you uh, tune the parameters appropriately, then you also observe that these clusters don't really merge with, with each other, but just, just stay, uh, uh, stay you know, on a microscopic, microscopic length scale. So in the usual phase of, in the usual phase of correlation phenomena, uh, as time goes on, one you see is really some, some sort of coarsening behavior. Uh, that's mainly driven by the, the, the surface speed energy, surface tension. Uh, so as time goes on, the clusters either coalesce together or due to some differences in the rate of evaporation and condensation, uh, like the bigger bubbles tend to get bigger and smaller bubbles tend to get smaller. And then you see it's quite a uh, merger into a huge cluster later on. But in active system, uh, active systems, you sometimes see uh, this cluster not really staying together, but having more or less some uniform uh, radius distribution, and in that case, you, uh, you observe microphase separation. So that was a simulation that I showed, but uh, you can uh, impl realize this system uh, using experiment, and uh, this is a very random experiment by Palazzi et al. Uh, and uh, so using this genus particle, uh, which are propelled by chemical reaction of hydrogen peroxide when light is turned on. Um, when light is on, then these particles form a sort of crystal-like structure by staying together. But then what, when the light is turned off and when these particles lose their proportion, then uh, these clusters uh, scatter and then disappear. Okay. So uh, how to understand uh, this phenomenon using a uh, kinetic picture. Now, um, you can understand this phenomena, uh, thinking about how two particles, two active particles which collide with each other will behave later on. So uh, when after they collide, uh, when the density is low or when the speed of each particle is low enough, then for some time, these two will push against each other, but then later on, uh, they will go their separate ways. So uh, in that case, uh, these particles will not stay together, but they will form a single phase. And that's what I mean, that's what I mean. they will not cluster and they will form just a single gaseous phase in that case. 
But when the density is sufficiently high or when the speed is sufficiently fast, then before these two particles are separate from each other, there will be a third particle coming here and then uh, it will collide. And then the same thing can happen again and again. And when you go to the amusement park, then you have these bumper cars, uh, which uh, do this kind of thing. And then like, these different kinds of cars are all pushing against each other and it's difficult to escape this kind of uh, cluster by turning around because that requires time. So basically what, what is happening in, in this active system is this kind of uh, clustering behavior. And this is a kinetic way of understanding, intuitive understanding this space separation behavior. And, and indeed, um, so th basically there's this positive feedback between uh, increased density of particles and uh, reduced effective speed of uh, particles. Because when, when the density is high, then the particle tends to get stick, get stuck together in this manner, and then the effective velocity decreases and it takes time until the particle escapes this cluster. So, so this sort of act as a also sort of effective attraction between particles and that gives rise to phase separation. So this is called the mortality in this phase separation. Now this is a really standard terminology in this discipline of active matter and it's also called MIPS uh, in short. But actually this kinetic picture uh, so explains why uh, particles space separate, but it doesn't really give intuition into why uh, micro phase separation occur really. Uh, so there's this uh, question, under the question about uh, whether I have pairwise correlation uh, function here. Uh, yeah, I, actually, if I was going to uh, discuss the full hydrodynamics today, I, should, I, I was actually uh, preparing the slide for that, but uh, no, obviously not, not on here, but you, yes, of course you can uh, try to say something about the correlation function. Uh, later on, using the linear expansion around the uh, lower density. And then you can start to see, the, you, you, can, you can say something about crossing behavior, uh, which uh, explains how the domains uh, become larger and larger as time goes on. And that, that gives you uh, a sort of uh, power exponent over time. Uh, yeah, so uh, so to explain this micro phase separation, actually, you need to turn to a fair theoretical picture. So this is where uh, you start to actually get something which is really a proper uh, fair theory. So as for the active agile gas, um, uh, well, you still have density and current, but, but there was no interactive case, so that was rather somewhat trivial uh, field theory. But in this case, now you've started to really model the interactions between particles. Uh, so this work was actually done by the KH group, and then uh, it's, it is called active model B plus, because uh, so the name comes from the model B, uh, uh, which na whose name comes from this famous uh, hyperin. Uh, what was the name? So yeah, the, 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 the famous paper in 1977. Um, so, uh, the, uh, so depending on the symmetry of this system uh, and the conservation loss of this system, uh, there's this whole classification scheme of the statistical field theories describing how the system behaves uh, near phase transition or at least how the system phase separate. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the model B is for the case when the system has like up down symmetry of spin or particle hole symmetry, and when, which is also called Z2, Z2 symmetry mathematically. And when the system has density conservation low in the rest, uh, so, so when you have these only two first, so first two elements in the model, then you are going to have model B. So, um, so as for this uh, series of equations that I have written down here, um, so this density conservation is modeled by this, con uh, this continuity equation for phi, phi is like a density here. Uh, 
or actually the uh, it actually represents the excess density in this case. So uh, uh, relative to some given uh, baseline level. So actually phi can be positive or negative depending on whether the density is higher or lower uh, compared to this that baseline. And here J is the current and this lambda is the Gaussian white noise. Um, and this is just assumed to be Gaussian white noise for um, convenience sake. Uh, so uh, this is more or less uh, very hand wavily justified by saying that you expect some sort of uh, low large numbers to be effective here on, on, this, on this length scale and time scale that we are interested in. And then this current arises from, uh, first of all, from this um, free energy gradient, which you have here. So this F is free energy gradient and like phi is the, is the density. So this is like a functional derivative of free energy gradient at a given location in space. And the current arises from the gradient of that guy. So actually this, this functional derivative is more like uh, more like chemical potential here. And the current rises from the chemical potential gradient here. And if you ha didn't have this lambda or zeta related terms, then uh, this along with this expression for F, which involves uh, this lambda free energy, uh, sorry, uh, this, um, uh, this Ginsburg lambda like uh, free energy density um, gives the model B. So this, uh, you, you can notice this Z2 symmetry here. And also this, uh, this uh, domain uh, aligned, uh, sorry, this particle-particle uh, this, um, alignment term here, uh, which comes from this, this scale of gradient. So if K is positive, then uh, particles tend to stick with particles and holes tend to stick with holes. So if you had only these elements, then you have model B. But now, uh, in addition to these guys, you now introduce some additional terms here, mainly those coming from non-zero lambda and zeta. So why do you have these particular terms? So they model the non-equilibrium effect, which can't, which can never be reduced uh, to this free energy effect. So when you take this functional data free energy and take this gradient, then, then you will start to see some, some sort of uh, multiples, there's multiples of combinations of phi and gradient of phi and Laplacian of phi, et cetera, et cetera. But this lambda, gradient of phi square term, and this zeta uh, Laplacian phi times gradient phi term can never be produced from this uh, gradient of some free energy. So since they are non-gradient terms, non-free energy gradient terms, they are therefore bound to be non-equilibrium terms. And also uh, we introduced this constraint that we are, inter we are interested only in the long, uh, things happening only in the long length scale and long time scale. Okay. And, and that means we are only going to think about like long range, effect of long range modulations of density. And that gives you some uh, constraint on, sorry, some, some kind of hierarchy about uh, what kind of terms are more dominant and what kind of terms are less dominant here. Uh, so basically you are trying to involve uh, only the like leading order terms which has only like, like, uh, like three gradient, three, three nebulas here that, that, uh, that uh, give rise to current. So this lambda term has three nebulas here, and the zeta term also have only three nebulas here. Okay, so that's where uh, you can gain the name active. Uh, what gives rise to this uh, extra name active? No, so lambda and z times active. And what, what, what about this plus? Uh, well, this is just to, due to some historical reason. Uh, originally, uh, the authors of this uh, paper didn't actually consider this zeta term. They only consider the lambda term and call the active model B. But then they later on uh, consider the zeta term as well and then included this plus here. Okay, 
So uh, yeah, this is what active model B plus means. And this, this is basically how you uh, drive this theory based only on symmetry and conservation law and dissipation and long wavelength considerations. So of course, at the moment, it is unclear how this lambda and zeta, et cetera, and A and B and K, et cetera, connect to the microscopic features of this active particle dynamics. But, but the, the power of this approach is that uh, you get a very uh, principle-based uh, phenomenological, phenomenological description of a broad range of microscopic models of active particles. Uh, and you may expect that uh, basically this is how you uh, understand the universality classes or pattern formation behavior of this kind of active system. Now, notice that, uh, so basically this system only involves uh, density as the major uh, variable describing the state of the system. So therefore that basically means this is an active scalar active matter, okay? Like, like, like the like this active uh, Ulmstein Ulmbeck process that I gave as a third example in the beginning of this talk, like this like like, like those uh, scalar active like those particles which are driven by active noise rather than uh, having some like dynamical variable describing its orientational proportion. So only density matters and uh, like velocity is treated more like noise here. Yeah. Now, this is a theoretical result based on uh, this field theory. Uh, so, uh, as we simulate this system using a numerical technique uh, named uh, lattice Boltzmann method, uh, now you can tune this parameter zeta and lambda. And in this middle region and the left top and right bottom region, you see that when you have two bubbles in the system, then one of them becomes smaller and the other one becomes larger as time goes on. And then so in, in the end, you just get a single large bubble. So this is called Ostwald ripe, Ostwald ripening in soft metaphysics. Uh, and, and you, you can describe this kind of uh, behavior theoretically even. And when you look at the like correlate two point correlation function, actually this kind of uh, behavior gives rise to the correlation length increasing with time, uh, like, like, like for example, t to the one third, for example. Uh, so in this case, uh, what you have is that the effective surface tension or what you call pseudo tension describing the evaporation from each bubble. So I, I maybe bubble, uh, maybe it's better to say, okay, let's say evaporation and condensation from each bubble uh, is positive here. Okay, so, uh, so these two bubbles uh, can coalesce because this effective positive pseudo tension that tends to reduce the surface area when it comes to evaporation and condensation. Now, uh, when you have these large values of Z time lambda, so which corresponds to this upper right and lower left regions, then you see a completely opposite phenomenon. So when you have two bubbles, then these two bubbles are later on tend to have the similar sizes. Okay, their radius, their radii uh, tend to converge together. And that's essentially because, uh, because of this third term, sorry, sorry, this zeta term, um, which corresponds to some like, which gives rise to uh, this circulating current in the system. If, if, if you look at this term, then you will see it doesn't come from this gradient-like term, but it comes from a term which cannot be expressed as a gradient. That means that this term gives rise to non-zero curl of the, of the current. So that means basically this guy can have circulating pattern. And the circulating current 
uh, can induce effectively negative surface shoot tension. So uh, you should actually take care here that uh, be, be warned that uh, this shoot tension only governs evaporation and condensation at the surface rather than the mechanical tension of each bubble or cluster. Okay? So the mechanical tension is actually still positive even in these measures. That's why these bubbles can stay in a circular, stay in a circular shape. But when it comes to the surface shoot tension governing the evaporation and condensation, then you can derive from this first theory that the effective shoot tension is negative. And that gives rise to uh, this reverse ostwald ripening. And that means uh, uh, after some point, uh, these guys, uh, these, these bu bubbles or clusters will cease uh, coarsening and get arrested. And that gives rise to microphase separation. And this theory illustrates that this micro separation is indeed a non equilibrium effect arising from uh, this current, this non equilibrium current uh, dissipation current terms. Okay, so um, so uh, okay, I, I think if I had time, I think I would have the slide about. Um, connecting that phenomena to this, um, this soot body formation behavior of this um, um, mix of bacteria census. Uh, but like, like there's some recent study by a uh, Christian Marketing Group, uh, which tries to uh, explain this coarsening behavior of this kind of system uh, based on uh, this, uh, this myth theory. So it seems that this, this microbacteria, as this mix of bacteria census, is uh, essentially in a regime where uh, myths occurs. And then like the, the way this, uh, this length scale grows to some extent is, uh, seems, to be, seems to be of the same universality class as the myths described by the, the, the field theory. So that's one example where you can uh, sort of apply this myth theory to an actual biological system. Uh, but of, of course, uh, that's more at the level of very, very, uh, very uh, broad uh, maxotic phenomena, phenomenological features. If you really go into details, then uh, these myths of bacteria are not really like scale acting matter. They have like this proportional directions and um, I mean, complicated stuff, but uh, what people could amplify found was that uh, basically the power law, the one 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 sort of power law, was similar to what. Uh, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. The power law exponent governing the coarsening behavior uh, seems to be the same for. Uh, for these two kinds of, uh, for this mixed case. And well, what about the microphase separation from the biological context? So, uh, 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 well, I, I've been always checking the literature for whether there would be any uh, good example of microphase separation that corresponds to uh, this actual uh, actin matter, I'm sorry, this, this catalactin matter theory. Um, so, Indeed, you have some uh, nice simulation results, which shows that the microphase separation indeed uh, happens uh, at the level of particle dynamics. Uh, so there are some studies on like active brain, some sort of active brain particles showing that kind of behavior. But as for the biological examples, uh, there is not really any conform direct confirmation of it at the moment. But you can still make a very um, uh, bored guess about what, how, how, what kind of biological phenomena might be benefiting from the kind of uh, microphase separation. So for, so for example, uh, you, you can think about uh, organelles without membranes that you can find in 
uh, our cells. So for example, within the nucleus, the cell nucleus, uh, you have this structure called nucleolus, which is really a cluster of uh, our RNAs. So it's really a cluster which uh, produce uh, these uh, ribosomes, which are really like uh, ribosomes like responsible for producing all kind of proteins, etc. Uh, so, uh, so this is this nucleus is a sort of like a factory that resides in your nuclear nucleus. And what is important here is that this nucleus nucleolus doesn't have any membrane, and therefore uh, it stays separated from the rest of the nucleus purely uh, by phase separation. And since this is a factory, now if you if, if these factories merge together and form a large factory, then what would happen is that the volume to surface area ratio will increase. And if surface area is smaller compared to the volume, then what might happen is that uh, the influx and efflux of basic materials needed for producing things uh, might become slower, might not be high enough for uh, production, smooth production of things. So um, actually this kind of small factories in your body might benefit from microphase separation. They have to keep high surface area to uh, volume ratio. And that might, be part, that might be implemented or might benefit from some degree of activity present in this system. So, um, so MIPS mechanism might be playing some role here, but of course uh, there's no real uh, biological proof of it here at the moment. Or um, you might even say uh, phase separation was responsible for how the, the very first cell emerged from uh, inanimate uh, things. So this is the uh, very famous theory by Oparin about how the very first cell, the protocell uh, emerged uh, from the environment. So, so he assumed that there were uh, droplets of opposite charged molecules, which when concentrated uh, facilitate uh, some kind of chemistry. And so thereby they start to produce uh, matter by producing some kind of inner environment, which is separate from the external environment. But well, so basically uh, what Oparin assumed was that there has to be some sort of um, like electric charge which enable uh, this kind of clustering behavior. So he was to some extent still relying on uh, equilibrium assumptions in order to produce this structure which doesn't have membrane. But what if we introduce activity into this immersion of droplets? Uh, so uh, yeah, since uh, I think I'm already over time a bit, so I, I will just be very brief about this particular model. So this is a study by this uh, Zipker and Weber group, uh, on active immersion. And they, they considered uh, some sort of a simplistic model of uh, protocell, which comes from some building blocks B, which can stay together and they basically come from some precursor material P. And this precursor material P can become this building block B only by uh, chemical driving. So there has to be some fuel, chemical fuel around this system, uh, which converts this precursor B into the building block B. And then when it got B, then it can stick together. But of course, if there's no influx of fuel, then all of these building blocks B will just uh, disintegrate into this big changes because of P. And then they can they cannot form this uh this droplet. Okay, so what happens is that there is some constant supply of fuel from the external environment that converts P into B, and this B will form a droplet, and then this B will naturally decay into P, and then again it will, it, it will get detached from this building, uh, this, this droplet and evaporate away. 
So there is this some sort of current influx and outflux uh, driven by this fuel consumption. So this is also going to be a sort of phase separated system which has some bigger degree of activity. Now, what normally happens when this droplet gets deformed is that because of the surface tension, uh, this deformation will, uh, this deformed droplet will experience some kind of restoration force which tries to uh, make it come back to this original spherical symmetric shape. Okay. But what happens in this active system is that when the droplet gets deformed, it changes the influx of uh, sorry, the concentration profile of this building block B around, around this droplet. Now, uh, because of this, this deformation, uh, there's a, like a larger uh, gradient in one direction, uh, larger gradient of this concentration period of B in one direction than the other. And uh, that is in such a manner that uh, this deformation is actually more amplified by this influx of or influx of B. So what happens is that when the fuel concentration is sufficiently high, then this concentra concentration gradient of B will become, will have a stronger uh, gradient. And then that gives rise to, the eventually gives rise to instability of this deformation. So instead of going back to the original sphere spherical shape, uh, this uh, droplet gets split it in two the two total droplets. And that gives rise to this self-replicating of protocell behavior. Okay. So of course, of course there's no guarantee that this is really a protocell. Of course, this is how, how this is this really a protocell of, I mean, how, what the protocell really looked like in the beginning. But, uh, and of course, I mean, to produce this replicating behavior, actually there can be many, many other different, different kinds of mechanisms. And there are even like a membrane-based explanations for this. But, but this suggests an interesting way of just viewing how this replicating behavior can emerge from uh, like activity, from acting matter. Because, uh, well, in the beginning of this, uh, emergence of light, uh, perhaps what it first had was not really a real living system, but more like some kind of active system, uh, which is staying out of equilibrium by consuming some kind of fuel. So what is conceptually satisfying here is that uh, you are getting this kind of very lifelike behavior only from very simplistic, uh, like non-equilibrium model. which nicely uh, complements this uh, Oparin's original theory about uh, acerbates and at this uh, self-replicating feature. Another way of introduce, uh, I mean, producing this replicating feature is to think about momentum conservation and try to introduce that feature into the active model B that we discussed before. So, in that case, you are going to have some kind of active model H as well, which also considers the momentum conservation and introduces it into the model. And also it is now known that that model uh, shows this kind of self-replicating behavior. And it would be interesting to check whether uh, these belong to the same universality class, but uh, I'm not going into the detail at the moment and that is not known at the moment. Okay, so uh, we can draw some lessons uh, about from this active idle gases, sorry, active scalar, active scalar matter uh, uh, typo here. So mortality of active matter can induce phase separation. So actually you have mortality of active matter and storage interactions and it gives us phase separation. And this phase separation features uh, micro phase separation and self division, uh, which might uh, be biologically uh, relevant and in some cases shown to be biologically relevant. And of course, uh, it would be interesting to pursue this line of thought about whether uh, this kind of phase suppression behavior, uh, which are characteristic of active systems, uh, will explain 
how active matter uh, contributed to the, the real beginning of life. So yeah, basically uh, this is a summary. Uh, active matter is really about time before symmetry broken at the level of each particle. And therefore the system is everywhere far away from equilibrium instead of being driven by some global field. And every order arising in the system is purely due to safe organization of this integer particle, giving rise to structure, global structure. And active matter uh, give rise to very noble collective phenomena, which are described by phenomenological theories uh, like active field theories, which can drive based on symmetries and conservation laws. And I gave a very uh, uh, brief introductory explanation about how you can drive the theory from uh, those conservations. And uh, this active matter provides a simple paradigm for understanding how collective phenomena involving living matter can emerge from magnetic interactions. Uh, so now, uh, when, when it comes to the question of life and what really life features, of course, we had this shredding verse, a uh, very simplistic uh, uh, characterization about a non nuclear system feeding on negative entropy. But, uh, but if you try to be a bit more sophisticated, then you can also think about these seven pillars, uh, which are uh, listed in this uh, science paper, science essay. Uh, so there's this program, which is about really the genetic code governing uh, what kind of proteins are uh, uh, expressed. And there's this uh, improvisation, which has to do with the um, Evol uh, the, the, the evolution of this uh, genetic code and compartmentalization, uh, which is related to how a different part of body uh, become separated from each other and try to form compartment on its own, like, like tissues uh, in different kinds of cells, etc. And so you have this energy consumption and regeneration, which is like also essentially about reproduction. Uh, so you reproduce yourself to uh, replace old cells with new ones, old endemic cells with new ones. And also you have this adaptation, which is not at the level of genes, but at the level of uh, uh, keeping your body condition uh, the same despite uh, the changes in the environment. And of course, there's also the seclusion aspect, which is about how uh, different like chemical reactions, various chemical reactions in your body uh, still happens in its own way, despite uh, without getting entangled with each other. So uh, essentially the active matter, that uh, active matter models that I uh, introduced in today's talk, uh, I think sort of uh, approaches uh, I and mean, tries to address three of these uh, seven pillars, I think, maybe like compartmentalization uh, related to the space separation and of course energy uh, having more to do with basically how dissipation currents arise and regeneration having to do with uh, how even replication behavior can happen here. But of course, in the, in the long run, of course, the question would be about how uh, this series of active matter can be extended to deal with all the other kinds of uh, the seven class of life. Yeah, so uh, yeah, that's all I have to say today. And um, I'd be glad to answer more questions or hear your comments. And again, sorry for the, um, a bit of deviation from the original plan. Uh, oh, I, I said I would have more time, but uh, uh, obviously I had that as my uh, conclusion. And thank you. Thank you, Professor Beck. Uh, actually, I enjoyed a lot. Uh, now time for a discussion. Uh, so many people uh, show the, the plot. Okay. Um, uh, there is a question in the chat window. Can you check? Yeah, yeah, I will check. Uh, so there's the question from uh, Sangwon. So, uh, so the question is what conservation laws are important in active matter theory? So uh, yeah, so yes. So at the most basic level, if you're ignoring the third division or third death, um, for example, then you, you, you can say conservation of the number of particles is important. Um, if you are not really thinking about the dry active matter that I'm, I introduced today here, 
if you are thinking about the wet active matter, where you are still thinking about the momentum transfer between the active particles and the surrounding or ambient fluid, then you also have to uh, incorporate momentum conservation uh, into the system. Uh, so, so that's another important conservation law which can be important. Um, Maybe, uh, uh, of course, there, there can be like other, other conservation laws. Like, of course, here I'm only considering uh, the, uh, the, well, the, partic the effective particles here, but uh, uh, particle description here. But of course, you might want to introduce the fuel into the picture as well. In that case, conservation of fuel. Uh, which are really driving the active particles or really loading the active particles in some way through the quantum sensing or chemical taxes might also you have to consider in the case. Um, and yeah, uh, there's another question by uh, Rio Hai. So the zeta term looks at a glance on irrelevant term in the RG sense. Is there a way to understand why it could affect the features of the long time dynamics? Yes, that's a good question. And in this case, I have to actually consult the uh, literature again. There's really a, a paper by this Cage group which deals with this RG question. Um, and if I uh, recall correctly, in indeed this theta term uh, gives rise to some interesting uh, RG fixed point, uh, but but I actually don't recall exact. Maybe I have to check and maybe I will send you an email later on to answer the question. Uh, and sorry for that. And then uh, another question is about, uh, I, I mentioned asymmetric forces and can I make them to have uh, opposite signs? Uh, yeah, so maybe, yeah, maybe you are talking about whether I can have repression on one side and uh, Person on one side, one side, and uh, attraction on the other side. Uh, let, let, let me think about it. Um, so, yeah, in, in, in the most in the most basic case, um, this is not efficient. Um, Uh, okay, here is here. Um, so in the situation where um, you have like two shapes, which two, two objects which are shaped like this, and if they are like looking at it, looking at each other, then of course the like the change of density at each location due to the other object will be we have the same sign and the change of propulsion force due to the change of density will also be similar to each other, but, but that will be in the, that the direction will be determined by where, uh, where these uh, objects are headed to. So therefore you can trivially have opposite signs of the interactions. So, um, uh, but the opposite sign is actually coming from the direction of propulsion in this case. Um, and um, another another possible situation that you can imagine is that uh, these uh, these um, current introduced by uh, each object at all rotating the bodies in in some way, and uh, so what can happen is that one of the body is trying to pursue the other body in terms of uh, rotation direction, but the other body is also trying to escape the other body. So, so in, in, in that way, so I, I'm talking about the case where these two bodies are pinned at some location. And, and, and from that, uh, you can make these two bodies sort of rotate on and on, even, even when there's no uh, built-in uh, hierarchy in the system. So, uh, yeah, you can, you can, emit, you can, uh, Design some kind of interactive dynamical system uh, using this uh, this asymmetric sign of interactions. Uh, 
so yeah, basically that's on, I think that's that you can say is an example. That the, the thing that I just mentioned is an example of asymmetric talk. Unfortunately, I didn't uh, prepare the movie at the moment, but I probably I can show you. Yes, so um, yes, this is one example that you can have. So, as, so look at this uh, upper left uh, movie and you, you can see these two, two guys uh, like rotating in, in, in opposite directions in this manner. And that's coming from some sort of spontaneous uh, breaking of symmetry plus asymmetric torque. And, and you, you can see they rotate things, start rotating the other way. Okay, uh, yes, I think. There uh, was there any other question? Let me check. Yeah, I think that was about it. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, there is a one more question is coming. So. Probably, and we have enough time until 12. So take your time, uh, participants. Uh, you can you can make a voice. Hello, um, I have a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your long, nice lecture. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> good to see you again. Uh, so what makes um, active matter active is really the um, self-driving term. Yes. Right? Um, so uh, yeah. I was wondering um, whether we can understand the origin of this um, self-propelling term uh, in the more principled way. So, but in the first part of your talk, um, yeah. You introduced this um, time reversal symmetry breaking term by hands in, in simulation yes, and in, in theoretical in, in, analysis yeah. and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I was wondering, perhaps it has something to do with some kind of optimization. And then you showed some free energy finally, free energy functional. Um, so it is very unfortunate not to listen uh, what you had in mind in your free energy um, formulation theoretical approach. But anyway, by just glancing at your um, few formulations, I still don't see um, how this um, uh, free energy theoretical, um, of, I mean, field theoretical formulation will explain or at least give some explanation, explanation about this self-propelling term, because the current uh, you introduced in the non-Euclidean part is still placed by hands, right? Yeah, that actually that is basically the point in fact. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. non-Euclidean non yeah, yeah. in fact yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, it, yeah. It's not really from any self-consistent calculation out of generalized Landau-Ginsburg. Um, 
Uh, so, okay, let, 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 me, let me put it like this. So actually there are many levels of describing this system. So uh, for example, if you want to really understand how each active particle propel itself, um, then you have to really go into these um, considerations. So for example, in the case of genus particle, the concentration of diffusive forests, um, which means like how the surface reactions inducing local density gradient uh, leads to by some dynamics, some proper some by proper some dynamics uh, leads to the motion of this genus particle. And there are studies which precisely do that. Uh, for example, by like people like Ray Raymond Capra, for example. Uh, so um, maybe if you're interested, I can I can send those papers to you later on. Um, and but there's another level. Uh, so now, given that you understand uh, how this active force arises, then then now you can start forgetting about uh, how this force arises from the energy consumption, and then you just stick to the phenomenological particle-based model. Now, what you can do from here on is you just try to drive some kind of Boltzmann. Boltzmann, Boltzmann uh, equation for describing this particle dynamics. And then from it, uh, coarse grain it uh, using maybe like Chapman and Scott uh, theory, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, try to try to uh, derive this field theory really by course, by some uh, very sophisticated course, right? coarse graining approach. So it, 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 indeed there are uh, actually discussions on how the active model B plus can be derived from this phenomenological particle based model. And also, uh, there's this toner two model describing how active particles flock together. Uh, and in that case, you have this active particles with polarization, which, which means they have like velocity really behaving as their, uh, their dynamical variables. And then, in, in, in the case, you can also uh, drive the theory from microscopic uh, considerations by cross grain. Um, and on the other hand, this free energy here is really again uh, still a really phenomenological one. Uh, it only describes in, incorporates the phase separating behavior, in fact, um, and, and this is still at the fairly phenomenological level. And of course, uh, not exactly drive from microscopic level at the moment, but of course you can do it microscopically and try to see how A and B relate to uh, microscopic parameters, A and B and K. Uh, but, but yes, that's a very complicated process. And so, yeah, the, the basic philosophy, philosophy of today's approach that I introduced is that um, you are not really trying to be uh, very uh, picky about how, how this arises from microscopic dynamics, but you are trying to uh, just make some very reasonable assumptions about very broad features of the system and then try to uh, just single out terms uh, which will give you the proper universal, the, the universal class, uh, hopefully, describing the phase separation and critical phenomena. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And is there more? Question. If not, thank you, Professor Beck. Uh, it's very nice talk. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, it's very honor to inv invite you to this the lecture series. And and particip to a participant, uh, uh, next lecture will be on Korean time Thursday. Uh, at that time, it's a, a 4 p.m. It's not 10, 10 a.m. It's uh, uh, the speakers, uh, Pierre uh, Gaspard in the Brussels. Uh, so we hope to see you and uh, and to Korean people, enjoy your lunch. And, and 감사합니다. Thank you for all.
네, 감사합니다. 땡큐. 감사합니다. 땡큐. 네, 감사합니다. 잘 들었습니다. 네, 감사합니다. 논문 잘 보겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다.